go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter McKinnon, and I am the interim executive director of the School of Public Policy here at the University of Calgary. I should like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples in the home cities of both the University of Calgary and the Bank of Canada. We honour them and their ancestors for their immeasurable contributions to the country. The School of Public Policy here at the University of Calgary is Canada's leading policy school known for our practical research and for bringing people together to discuss the important issues with experts, which is what we are here to do today. On behalf of the School of Public Policy and the Bank of Canada, we would like to thank you for joining us for a conversation with Deputy Governor Tim Lane. Timothy Lane became Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada in 2009. In this capacity, he shares responsibility for decisions with respect to monetary policy and financial stability. He also oversees the bank's funds management and currency functions, including the bank's ongoing research and analysis of developments in financial technology, crypto assets, and digital currencies. Mr. Lane served for 20 years on the staff of the International Monetary Fund. During that period, he contributed to the IMF's analysis of numerous countries and conducted research on a wide range of topics, including monetary policy, financial crises, IMF reform, and economic transition. In 2008, he joined the Bank of Canada as an advisor to the governor a position he held until his current appointment. Let me now welcome most warmly and turn the conversation over to Deputy Governor Lane. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Peter. I was really looking forward to getting on a plane and coming to Calgary to give this speech. Uh, you know, last time I was uh, uh, in, at the University of Calgary, I found it was a really good audience, really engaged, uh, great questions. and. You know, I, was, I would really have loved to have been in the room with you and, uh, and, and your students. But anyway, this is, uh, is what it is, and, uh, and it's certainly the next best thing. So um, for two years now, we've been living through a period of history like no other. Successive waves of COVID-19 have claimed the lives of many Canadians and have also resulted in long-term health uh, damage for many others. And the economic impacts have also been extraordinary. The Canadian economy has now recovered substantially, economic activity is above its pre-pandemic level, and employment is near its maximum sustainable level. But the economy is still not back to normal. This has been a time of tremendous uncertainty, both for economic policymakers and for those in the fields of health and science. So it seems fitting to begin our discussion with a thought from renowned Canadian physician, William Osler, who is often described as the father of modern medicine. Over a century ago, Dr. Osler transformed the way medicine was taught by combining classroom study with bedside experience. He said that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. That saying could apply equally well to economic policy and certainly never more so than now. Indeed, Osler's emphasis on the need to combine analysis with experience is highly relevant to the uncertain world of economics. Aujourd'hui, j'aimerais vous parler de la façon dont la Banque du Canada prend ses décisions en période de turbulence, et je vais me servir de la pandémie comme étude de cas. Today, I would like to talk about how the Bank of Canada makes decisions in turbulent times, using the pandemic as a case study. In doing so, I will draw back the curtain on the bank's deliberations during various stages of the crisis and how our thinking at different stages shaped our policy actions and our communications with Canadians. Finally, I'd like to speak more generally about how we're adapting our own practices at the bank to better anticipate and respond to uncertainty. Let me first set the stage by briefly reviewing what has happened to the Canadian economy over the past two years. In early 2020, 
the pandemic triggered sudden and severe economic contractions around the world. In Canada, gross domestic product declined by about 15%, and about 3 million Canadians lost their jobs. Inflation also declined sharply from around 2% to near zero. This was largely due to a collapse in world oil prices. We also saw declines in the prices of hard to distance services, such as air travel, for those few who were still flying. But if the economic contraction was unprecedented, so was the recovery that followed. As we can see in chart one, and I hope that's showing, um, GDP bounced back sharply in the second half of 2020 when the initial surge in the number of COVID cases uh, had passed. More recently, GDP actually surpassed its pre-pandemic level. And as this next chart shows, the recovery in employment was also quite impressive. We can see that robust job gains have brought employment back to where it was before the pandemic. A range of measures shows that with this recovery, overall slack in the Canadian economy has been fully absorbed. Indeed, we are seeing increasing signs of scarcity of labor as well as of some goods. Meanwhile, the next chart shows that inflation not only recovered from near zero, but is now well above the bank's 2% target. This surge in inflation has certainly been more persistent than anticipated. Part of it reflects a catch up in prices after inflation dropped so far in 2020, as we can see here in panel B on the chart the right-hand panel. It also reflects the impacts of both supply constraints, con constraints and strong demand in global markets, especially for goods. And I'll talk more um, uh, later on about uh, some of the factors that went into that. We now expect that inflation will remain close to 5% for the first half of this year. So now that we've talked about our journey over the last two years, let's turn our attention to the policy response in those early days of the crisis. L'ampleur et la complexité de la pandémie ont dépassé tout ce qu'on pouvait imaginer. Comment la banque a-t-elle navigué ses eaux? The sheer scale and complexity of this pandemic was beyond what anyone anticipated. How did the bank navigate its course? Once the virus spread across the world and the first lockdowns were implemented, we clearly understood that the economic and financial impacts would be serious. Just how serious was quite uncertain, but we knew that the situation called for extremely aggressive policy responses right from the start. Our thinking was that it was better to do too much up front to strongly support the recovery than to play catch up later. When the pandemic first hit, the top priority was to support Canadian households and businesses. In addition to helping those most directly affected, our goal was to prevent second round effects on other sectors of the economy. Notably, the impacts that can occur when those who have lost incomes cut back their spending. We were also worried about businesses delaying investments. A second problem we needed to tackle right away was the breakdown of financial markets. In an atmosphere of panic in March of 2020, asset values plummeted and we saw a generalized dash for cash. Market liquidity suddenly evaporated. In other words, sellers had difficulty finding buyers, even for safe assets such as government bonds. This dynamic threatened to block the flow of credit for households and businesses just when they needed it most. The bank responded swiftly and aggressively to restore calm to financial markets. We provided liquidity to the financial system on a large scale through several channels, including repurchase agreements and direct asset purchases in a range of financial markets. These actions, alongside similar measures taken by central banks in other countries, quickly restored market functioning worldwide. It was clear that the federal government's fiscal policy would need to take primary responsibility for supporting households and businesses because it could focus that support to manage the uneven impacts of the pandemic. Many Canadians who had the option of working remotely, such as professionals, stayed employed. Meanwhile, many in hard to distance services, disproportionately staffed with lower wage workers, racialized Canadians and women, lost their jobs 
the government quickly responded with transfers to support incomes for affected households and to keep businesses afloat. The bank, uh, the bank acted forcefully with monetary policy as well. During March of 2020, we cut our policy interest rate three times from one and three quarters percent to one quarter of a percent. That's because if left unchecked, the pandemic forces at work on the economy in those early days could drive inflation persistently below zero, starting a deflationary spiral. In January, sorry, in July, we pledged to keep the rate at this level of a quarter of a percent until economic slack is absorbed. In October, we complemented our conditional forward guidance with a forecast, but not a commitment of when we thought that that condition would be met. The decision not to commit to a specific date reflected the great uncertainty around the outlook. We also committed to continue our purchases of government bonds until the recovery was well underway. These purchases were made initially to restore market functioning, but then served as another tool of monetary policy, quantitative easing. This tool was implemented to keep borrowing costs low across the yield curve. The overriding goal was to support the economy through this economic contraction and bring inflation back to the bank's 2% target. These policies combined a bold response with a clear exit strategy. Given the heightened uncertainty, our exit from emergency measures had to be based on outcomes, not on a fixed calendar. That is, we would provide liquidity to the markets until market functioning was restored. We would continue quantitative easing, easing until the recovery was well underway. We would maintain our forward guidance until slack was absorbed. We provided clarity about the conditions for exit while recognizing that the timing must depend on how the situation unfolded. As events played out, we updated Canadians on when the conditions were likely to be satisfied. Markets could also update their own views as data came in. The recession Canada faced was nothing like the textbook case, and there was exceptional uncertainty about how it would play out. In fact, in our April 2020 monetary policy report, we did not publish our usual forecast, but instead presented a range of possible outcomes, as we see here. These possible outcomes reflected two distinct dynamics. Some economic activity and employment would return to normal levels as soon as the pandemic subsided and lockdowns were lifted, similar to what often happens following a natural disaster. Other economic activity would take longer to come back. Indeed, in the spring of 2020, economists around the world debated about whether the recovery would be V-shaped or L-shaped or maybe some other letter. The bank's view was that each of these dynamics would likely play out in turn, resulting in a two-phase recovery, first reopening and then recuperation. Why did we expect full recuperation to take longer? It was partly because of our experience with the global financial crisis of 2008-09. The long drawn out recovery that followed that crisis reflected a large and prolonged rise in unemployment and massive damage to balance sheets. As a result, the global economy took about 10 years to recover to its pre-pandemic trend, or to a pre-crisis trend. Labor markets can be damaged by lengthy recessions. Unemployment can have persistent effects on people's skills and on their ability to re-enter the workforce. Because the pandemic began with such a huge increase in unemployment and so much uncertainty around how long the pandemic would last, this concern was front of mind. The unevenness of job losses caused by the pandemic also suggested that inequality could widen, which itself has, has negative economic consequences. In all, we saw powerful down, downdrafts in the economy in those early months reflected in our expectation that it would take until 2023 for slack to be fully absorbed. The same view was evident in our projection for inflation at that time. We can see in chart five that in our earlier projection, which is the red line, um, uh, showed inflation creeping up to our 2% target over three years. Needless to say, that is not exactly how things turned out. 
the economy's path of recovery has followed the upper edge of the range we had contemplated. It's the most optimistic uh, sort of scenario we were prepared to consider. Um, employment recovered also recovered more quickly than expected, but inflation persistently ran much higher than anticipated and is now well above our target. But why? It really comes down to supply and demand. In the early months of 2020, we realized that the pandemic would have adverse effects on both demand and supply. On the demand side, we expected households to rein in their spending, while job losses translated into lower household incomes and weaker confidence. The experience from the global financial crisis also suggested that financial institutions could be less willing to lend amid the heightened uncertainty. This experience also suggested that it could take a long time for consumer confidence and therefore spending to recover. On the supply side, we anticipated a temporary loss of supply or productive, productive capacity. Some production facilities were simply locked down. Um, and for others, the extra time and effort needed to comply with health requirements could weigh on productivity. But our projections assumed that the effect on supply would be less severe and would ease fairly quickly as restrictions were lifted. Since demand was expected to take longer to recover than supply, that meant that persistent economic slack would continue to put downward pressure on inflation. There are several ways in which supply and demand behaved differently than we expected. For one thing, vaccines were developed and deployed in record time, a little more than a year after the pandemic first began and one year sooner than we originally assumed. In addition, we underestimated the ability of businesses and workers to adapt to the pandemic and learn how to work around it in innovative ways. This period is marked by accelerated growth in all aspects of the digital economy. These are important reasons why both demand and supply and therefore, therefore uh, GDP recovered so quickly. The forcefulness of our economic policy response, that means not just ours at the Bank of Canada, but also the government's, also helped us avoid many of the negative effects on demand that we had been concerned about. The scale of fiscal transfers in particular meant that the disposable income of Canadians, Canadian households actually increased during the pandemic and business bankruptcies declined, both unheard of during a recession. Households were able to increase their savings and pay down non-mortgage debts. And the financial system, after the measures were taken to stabilize it, far from being a source of drag on the economy, became a sturdy support. A related factor that was initially underestimated was the shift of demand, both in Canada and abroad. Households that couldn't spend on services like restaurant meals and vacations shifted their spending to goods that were available, such as sports equipment, appliances, and electronics. This shift towards goods, which also happened globally, increasingly ran up against global supply constraints during 2021 and contributed, importantly, to push inflation higher than expected. Production disruptions proved to be a more troublesome force than originally anticipated because production is, a, is uh, highly interconnected across countries. Disruptions in one country quickly resulted in supply shortages in others. Specific choke, choke points surfaced, such as the supply of semiconductors and of shipping capacity, but the disruptions became increasingly persistent and widespread. Even now, it's unclear how long it will take to resolve these issues. Furthermore, Canadian firms have increasingly faced their own capacity constraints. A record number of respondents to our December Business Outlook survey said that they would have difficulty meeting increased demand. This partly reflects shortages of essential imported components, but I, it also speaks to the shortages of workers, particularly those with specialized skills brought along by tightening, tightening labor markets. Combining all these factors, demand was more robust and supply more constrained than we expected, resulting in stronger than expected economic growth and persistently higher inflation. Throughout all this, we adjusted monetary policy as the recovery advanced. We scaled back our quantitative easing, ending it in October of 2021 and entered the reinvestment phase. We now purchase bonds only to keep our overall holdings stable as bonds mature. And while our exceptional forward guidance, 
remained in place until a few weeks ago, we regularly updated our view of when the necessary conditions to raise interest rates would be met. On January 26, 2022, we removed forward guidance altogether based on our assessment that slack in the economy had been absorbed. We expect that interest rates will need to increase with the timing and pace of those increases guided by the bank's commitment to achieving our 2% inflation target. We indicated that once we begin to raise the policy rate, we will consider exiting the reinvestment phase and reducing the size of our balance sheet by allowing maturing bonds to roll off. Many of the factors that influenced our policy deliberations throughout the pandemic have come into sharper focus as we gain experience with a recession that is unlike any other. This illustrates why it's so important to have decision-making processes that can adapt to new information, analysis, and experience, which is what I'd like to talk about next. Much of what I've been discussing is not well captured by our standard economic models. Indeed, over time, we have adjusted our models so that they could relate better to the unique circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. Bank of Canada economists have also been increasingly drawing on novel sources of data to get a sense of what is happening on the ground. Real-time data have been especially valuable because the situation has been changing so rapidly. For example, we have increasingly been focusing on a wider range of labor. We've been um, focusing on a wider range of. Um, we've been. Uh, for example, online restaurant reservations and data from Interac on spending gave a more timely readout of consumer behavior. Such data became particularly important as the pandemic drove many more customers to, the, to do their shopping and other activities online. Similarly, online job postings complemented other indicators we used to assess labor market conditions. During the pandemic, epidemiological data have also been essential and we have been talking regularly with epidemiologists and with public health officials to help us to interpret those data. The uneven economic impacts of the pandemic further underscore the importance of looking at data broken down in various ways. This has allowed us to better assess how situations were affecting different groups of people in unequal ways and how this might affect economic outcomes on a larger scale. This illustrates why it's so important to have decision-making processes that can adapt to new, sorry, this is, um, got mixed up, sorry. Oh, for example, we have been focusing on a wider range of labor market indicators and publishing them in our quarterly monetary policy report and on our website. To make better use of all these data, our economists have been taking innovative approaches, including working with big, big data and advanced analytics. These new analytical tools and information sources have allowed us to fill important gaps in our understanding of what was happening in all parts of the economy. Events such as the pandemic show the, also show the value of talking with and listening to Canadians. To quote Dr. William Osler again, Listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. For many years, we have carried out our quarterly business outlook survey and maintained a regular dialogue with business leaders. This was instrumental, for example, and remains so, to understanding the nature and extent of supply constraints affecting Canadian companies. We now also conduct the Canadian sur survey of consumer expectations four times a year which amongst other things helps us evaluate the extent to which consumer inflation expectations remain anchored. We are also pursuing a deliberate strategy of broadening the set of stakeholders we consult to sharpen our insights into the economy. More generally, turbulent times call for openness to new facts and ideas and agility in decision making. Uncertainty may require a cautious and gradual approach when entering uncharted territory. But as the pandemic has illustrated, there are times when policymakers must act boldly. Any policy involves risk, but inaction 
can be riskier. It's important to take those risks, but it's equally important to fully understand them and to be transparent in communicating their nature. When coming to a policy decision, the bank looks at several risks and assesses their relative importance. Many risks are two-sided, but we may be concerned about, more concerned about one side than the other. This has been particularly true during the pandemic. Given the magnitude of the impact at the beginning of the crisis, our primary concern about the downside risks of, to the economy led us to deliver an aggressive monetary policy stimulus. As the situation evolved, however, our policy action has shifted along with the balance of risks. Currently, with inflation well above our target, we are increasingly focused on countering the upside risks. At different stages in the pandemic, we have changed our outlook and our policy stance to respond to the uncertain and fast-changing situation. What remained constant, however, was our commitment to our 2% inflation target and to explaining the basis for our projections and our decisions. At different étapes de la pandémie, nous avons révisé nos perspectives et l'orientation de notre politique monétaire en réponse au contexte incertain. Ce qui est demeuré constant toutefois, c'est notre engagement à notre cible d'inflation et à expliquer les fondements de nos projections et de nos décisions. We have been clear that we can't be certain about many things. We have also been candid in describing the risks involved at any moment. Although we cannot eliminate uncertainty, we can provide as much clarity as possible about the bank's actions and decision-making processes. This was clearly reflected in the conditions we included in our forward guidance throughout the pandemic. And it was in this spirit that we announced our decision in January, making it clear that with slack now absorbed, interest rates will need to be on a rising path to bring inflation sustainably back to the 2% target. Allow me to conclude. The pandemic has brought much that was unexpected we have drawn on our analysis and experience to reach a clearer understanding of the forces at work, but we must anticipate the possibility of more surprises before this chapter is closed. Si nous nous attendons maintenant à ce que les perturbations de l'offre apaisent et que l'inflation se modère rapidement dans la deuxième moitié de l'année, nous restons vigilants face au risque que l'inflation soit de nouveau plus persistante. Nous ferons preuve d'agilité et, s'il le faut, de fermeté en usant de nos outils de politique monétaire pour affronter la situation, quelle qu'elle soit, comme nous l'avons fait depuis le début de cette période mouvementée. While we now expect su supply disruptions to ease and inflation to come down quickly in the second half of this year, we are alert to the risk that inflation may again prove more persistent. We will be nimble and, if necessary, forceful in using our monetary policy tools to address whatever situation arises, as we have done throughout these turbulent times. We know that Canadians count on us to make the right decisions in the face of uncertainty and to navigate relent relentless change. And we will always work hard to be worthy of that confidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor Lane, uh, for your informative presentation covering decision-making lessons learned by the bank, the value of data analytics, and the importance of communication with stakeholders. My name is Seamus Hardy, and I am a graduate of the Bastard Public Policy Program and the current Vice Chair of the school's Alumni Council. I'm also going to be today's moderator for the Q&A session and invite our audience to submit any questions into the box on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, from which I will pose those questions to our speaker. Uh, so perhaps maybe a first question here for uh, the Deputy Governor. Uh, with current low interest rates and plans to keep bond holdings constant, what other monetary policy tools does the bank have at its disposal uh, without disrupting economic recovery? Well, at this point, we've already been clear that we're, those conditions are not um, going to continue. That we, you know, we've, uh, the Governor, for example, uh, in the uh, press conference uh, after, the, uh, after the decision in January indicated that interest rates will need to be on a rising path. And that means not just a one-off increase in interest rates from a quarter of a percent, but probably a, certainly, almost certainly a series of, of, of rate moves. And that 
of course, will have the effect of, uh, of restraining uh, of, 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 of rest restraining inflation as we go forward. He also indicated that we are uh, going to be considering moving out of the reinvestment phase and starting to reduce our holdings of Government of Canada bonds, and that will have the effect also of removing some of that stimulus which is in the economy, because currently our view is that, um, is that uh, there is no longer uh, on the whole economic slack in Canada, in the Canadian economy, or in the labor market, and it is now appropriate to start withdrawing some of this emergency monetary policy stimulus, and that will have the effect of, uh, on the whole, will, will have the effect of, of cooling down uh, the economy, but also of bringing inflation back to its 2% target. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps a follow-up is uh, what lessons has the bank learned with regards to effectively responding to economic crises without, or while remaining independent from the Canadian federal government? Well, certainly we've, I think we've uh, learned, um, as I've emphasized in the speech, we've learned to expect the unexpected. We've, uh, we, we've had a number of things that, uh, that we knew could happen and, uh, and, and we thought about and we kind of, you know, at the time we had to sort of weigh the different uh, the, the different uh, the strength of different forces at work, and uh, but 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 that was something that uh, uh, we knew was never going to play out exactly as we thought it would, and and certainly that's as my speech has uh, has, has uh, emphasized. Uh, you know, things did play out quite differently than we expected, and I think I think it's really a lesson about being adaptable. Is the fact that that uh, you can't get too wedded to your to, to your initial view, you have to be prepared to change it as new facts come in. And that's never been true more than in this kind of pandemic where you've got events that are unlike any that we've ever seen before and where we, um, we, where, where we really have to accept the fact that some things are gonna play out differently than we might uh, think in advance. Appreciate that. Perhaps on a related note, uh, are you able to comment on the long-term impacts of an increase in government debt that has occurred during the pandemic and how the central bank may address that? Well, certainly the, you know, the, the initial reason for the increase in government debt is, uh, you know, if I've stressed, as I've stressed, it's the fact that fiscal policy clearly needed to play a central role in addressing the pandemic. Um, uh, the economic consequences of the pandemic. I mean, monetary policy is too broad based. It affects everybody um, in the economy, uh, the, uh, whereas fiscal policy can be more targeted to people who've lost their jobs or to businesses that have lost revenues. And it was really appropriate, given the unprecedented nature and the uh, huge size of the shock, that fiscal policy deliver a very strong response. And that, that of course, was reflected in the run-up of debt. But of course, over the longer term, you have to have a fiscal position that's sustainable. And that means, um, that means bringing, you know, having a plan to bring the, uh, the, the deficit to a, to a state where it's not gonna, uh, where, where debt is not gonna keep increasing relative to the size of the economy. And that's obviously an essential condition for, for economic stability going forward. So, so that's really the, uh, and of course, from the point of view of the Bank of Canada, we take fiscal policy as a given. We, you know, we run monetary policy to achieve our inflation target, but we, we, you know, the, we recognize the fact that the, uh, the federal government and the provincial governments have an important impact on the economy through their uh, spending and, uh, and, and, and revenue collecting. And, and so that that is something that we have to factor into our assessment of how the economy is going to evolve and therefore into our decisions about what to do um, with the, um, what to do with our monetary policy. And speaking of inflation, what benchmarks or conditions will the bank consider on its roadmap to increasing interest rates uh, to achieve its inflationary target of 2%? Well, as, you know, as I highlighted in this speech, you know, th there are some reasons that we think inflation is going to come down in the second half of this year as some of the supply constraints ease. And we've seen that, you know, some of the, the shortages, for example, the shortages of semiconductors in the auto industry um, have eased and that's meant that uh, you know, some of the car producers that were, uh, as we've heard it, basically producing cars, uh, almost finishing producing cars, and, um, but not being able to put the semiconductors in at the end, they were, uh, they were sort of waiting for the parts to arrive, and so you had a lot of cars that weren't available, you know, households that are prepared to, uh, to wait, to, uh, you know, households were having to wait to get, to, to get delivery of cars. And, and meanwhile, of course, nobody's offering discounts on them. And so car prices were higher. 
But obviously, we've seen that those shortages have, have, have been eased. You know, we've had some of the semiconductors delivered. And so as, as that kind of thing happens, and I, I don't just mean semiconductors, but just across the whole range of things that have been constrained, then we'd expect inflation to be coming down um, later this year. But of course, um, we're going to be watching that very closely, as I highlighted. And, and if we see signs that inflation is still more persistent, that would on, on the whole tend to lead us to be more concerned about the risk that, uh, that, that inflation uh, uh, you know, is persistently higher and that we actually need to do more in order to, uh, to bring inflation uh, back to its target. So, so again, you know, as, as you, you know, our, our baseline is that we will be needing to increase interest rates just you know, based on what we currently know. But if, if things seem to break in a different direction, because we're not seeing that relief of supply constraints that we expected, then we're, uh, then, then we're going to be, have to, have to be uh, prepared to react to that. Well, assuming everything kind of holds steady here, uh, is there a certain period of time that you think will be needed to bring the bank, uh, bank's balance sheet uh, and perhaps the balance sheets of some of our peers, uh, countries, central banks back to a more level, normal level? Well, uh, as we've indicated, we're going to start, uh, we're going to certainly consider um, uh, starting that process fairly, and we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that as soon as we're starting to raise rates, and uh, quite likely we'll, we'll be saying something about that uh, in a couple of weeks' time when we're, uh, when we're actually at the stage of changing our, uh, 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 we're, when we're actually at the, uh, at, at, at our next uh, uh, at, at our next decision point. So, so it's um, so so we'll see how that uh, you know we, we'll be making some announcements in, you know before very long about uh, what kind of path we're likely to be following in terms of uh, moving our balance sheet back to normal. I mean, clearly it's it's at a much larger level than we expect it to be to, to be over the longer term, and so there will be a process, but we're not really in a position to make any announcements about that yet. Well, thank you. And as you stated in your speech, uh, inflation is very high right now. And we know that racialized communities have been affected disproportionately, uh, harder by the rising cost of living. Um, one of the questions that has come in is, does the bank recognize this trend? And what policy measures do you recommend to negate this? Sorry, I, uh, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the questions that had come in here was that we know that racialized communities have been affected disproportionately harder by the rising cost of living. Does the bank recognize this trend and what policy measures do you recommend to negate this? Well, I mean, generally, of course, inflation affects everybody uh, um, and, and we, can't, uh, we can't really differentiate. We have to uh, to deal with the overall price index, and generally, what we target is the is the consumer uh, consumer price index because that that's sort of a measure of what the average Canadian household is is uh, is spending. And so, uh, in that context, we we can't really differentiate our monetary policy in any way to target particular communities. But uh, but but really, we have a target to to bring down inflation for all Canadians. And when we do that, it's likely to. To, to benefit the communities you refer to as well. So that's, that's kind of how, how we've been looking at it to, uh, up to this point. Well, I, I think that was actually a point you had mentioned earlier was that monetary is more uh, broad versus fiscal. That's yeah. targeted. That's what I think that goes along with your points. Uh, another question here that I think is quite topical is, could you comment on the impact that recent protests and blockades may have had on inflation or potential interest rate hikes? Um, yeah, don't get me started. Well, it's uh, actually, uh, no, I mean, just to say a couple of things. I mean, the, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, most aware of the protests in Ottawa and their, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, big impact in the local community. I mean, I live within earshot of the, uh, of, of, of the truck horns, but, uh, but, you know, and sort of aware of a number of businesses having to close because of the harassment that their employees have been facing and, and that kind of thing. But those impacts are probably not very large in the scheme of the whole Canadian economy. But where the impacts, um, I think, were potentially larger were, were the border crossings. And there, you, you know, the potential that, you know, that large amount of Canadian trade could get interrupted. And both the both export trade, uh, which, which brings revenues to the exporters and their employees, but also imports of uh, materials and, you know, we're already facing these shortages, and just when things were starting to ease, then we have these blockades that were 
that, that are causing further problems with supplies. And we've, we've heard about the auto plants in, uh, in, in Windsor and, and also in Detroit that have been suffering from that. So, um, you know, clearly if these things were per to persist, they would, uh, or, 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 or the, the, there were further blockades, then they would have an impact on the, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the broader Canadian economy. But at this point, I mean, we will be assessing that uh, uh, in our upcoming decision, but, uh, but, but uh, um, it, it, I mean, hopefully it won't be, uh, it, it, it won't last long enough to, uh, to have a major impact, but, but, but of course we're, we're watching that. Thank you for that. And perhaps building on the uh, point of cross-border trade there, um, to what extent does the Bank of Canada's monetary policy, policy decisions depend on U.S. macroeconomic policy moves? Well, I mean, U.S. policies certainly have a big impact on Canada, both, uh, you know, through a, a few channels, um, uh, in, in including, uh, uh, you know, for example, if the Federal Reserve tightens, then it has an effect on, on Canada, first of all, because it affects uh, uh, interest rates in Canada directly, because, uh, a lot, you know, Canada is an open economy, there are a lot of financial assets are traded uh, between Canada and the U.S., and so uh, typically, especially for longer maturities, U.S., uh, uh, it, rates tend to have a large effect on Canadian uh, uh, Canadian rates, um, and uh, then uh, the second thing, of course, is the uh, is the direct impact on the on the Canadian uh, on the U.S. economy, which has a big effect on Canada. So, you know, tightening in the U.S. has an effect on um, has an effect on uh, on economic activity and inflation in the U.S., which has a direct impact on Canada via. Uh, traded goods, uh, their prices, and and uh, and by U.S. demand for Canadian products, and then third, um, of course, uh, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, monetary policy affects the Canadian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar because one of the major fa factors that affects the, uh, um, the the value of the Canadian dollar is sort of the broader uh, global value of the U.S. dollar, and if if the Federal Reserve tightens, that tends to other things being equal to, equal to push up the, the U.S. dollar relative to the Canadian dollar. And so that affects the Canadian economy through another channel. So, you know, combining all those effects, I mean, certainly we have to look at that, all those effects in our economic models. Um, and we take those as given in making our decisions on Canadian monetary policy. So, uh, you know, as we've emphasized, we don't have to move in step with the Fed, but it certainly has a big impact on, on the economic conditions in which we make our own decisions uh, to, uh, to affect inflation in Canada. I appreciate that. Well, and I guess we have time for one last question here. And it was something I was hoping to ask, uh, given that you're speaking to the School of Public Policy. So given the bank's comments on labor market tightness and productivity, uh, do you have any advice for students like ours that are entering the workforce? Well, certainly it's, it's uh, I mean, it's certainly much better to enter the workforce, enter the workforce at a time of tight labor markets than than at a time when there's a lot of unemployment around. And so uh, in that respect, I mean, things are certainly a lot better than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, the, uh, I think what we've seen particularly where, you know, we've talked to businesses, we hear a lot of uh, um, uh, reports from them of shortages of key skills, but particularly on the technological side. And, you know, the fact that, uh, that, that the Canadian, uh, um, the, the Canadian businesses are really uh, uh, trying to, up their game on the digital side. They're trying to make investments and they're trying to increase their staff in areas related to the digital economy. And that, uh, of course, requires having people with those skills. And so, um, and so uh, you know, that's partly, obviously, for those students who are lucky enough to have made that choice and to have come out uh, with those skills, it's certainly a very good time. But, uh, but I think for, for, for everybody, for, for universities and for governments and for, and for students who are you know, th contemplating what to study, it's certainly, certainly uh, everything related to, uh, to what's known as STEM, you know, science, technology, uh, and uh, engineering, um, and uh, mathematics. I mean, those are all, all skills that are very much in demand and, and uh, in short supply in Canada. So, so those are maybe some of the, uh, so, 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 so some points. I mean, maybe one other thing I'd say is that I think that this experience of the last couple of years just shows the, the benefit of being adaptable and the fact that, uh, you know, the, the economy has been changing very rapidly. And I think we all have to recognize that some of our expectations are just not going to be, uh, not going to be the way things turn out. And that, uh, and, and it really helps to be able to, uh, to, to, uh, 
kind of uh, uh, change your direction when things are uh, when things work out differently. And that uh, I think is a it's an important uh, lesson for central bankers, but it's also an important lesson I think for everybody. Well, thank you for those lessons and uh, words of wisdom, especially related to being resilient. Um, with that said, I'd now like to just move on to our concluding remarks. And once again, I want to thank you, Deputy Governor Lane, as well as the Bank of Canada for providing your tremendous insights, navigating uncertainty as a central bank. Uh, and of course, to our audience for joining today. So perhaps to add maybe one more Osler quote uh, to the Deputy Governor's speech, uh, a takeaway from today's talk is that the best preparation for tomorrow is to do today's work superbly well. Um, and for more information on the School of Public Policy and for future events, uh, I would encourage you to visit policyschool.ca. Uh, you'll also be able to view today's recording on that site, as well as the Bank of Canada's website. So on that note, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and have yourself a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.